Um, okay, I'm going to talk about endoscopic lumbar fusions. Um, here are my disclosures. So let me start out with a case. It's a 48-year-old uh, pediatric nurse. She's got back pain, neurogenic claudication, ODI of 50, um, and back pain scores and leg pain scores as illustrated. And her flexion extension view shows that she's got a two-level spondy. And if you look at her MRI, she's got some lateral recess stenosis, uh, along with what I call the facet fluid sign shown in that arrow. And I would say that this is the perfect endoscopic T-lift patient or endoscopic lumbar fusion patient because she's young and active and internet savvy, so she's the type of person that came to find me to do something slightly different than everybody else. She's younger, she has no osteoporosis, and she's what I consider indirect, decompre indirect decompression worthy. That means that in looking at her overall imaging studies, it looks like she reduced her spondy uh, and accomplished an indirect decompression. So you can see that with the flexion extension views and the facet fluid sign. And as it currently stands, it's not a very good technique to you know, fix sagittal uh, malalignment. So you want somebody that's well-balanced sagittally. So it's mostly an indirect decompression and stabilization procedure. So um, let me answer that because this is a really important question. So I do a two-level endo T-lift on her, um, and she ends up with a very good result. Her back pain score is a two now. Her ODI went from 50 to a four. She went home on the same day of surgery before midnight, um, and her PGII score, the, post, the patient's global impression of improvement is a one. Can't get any better than that. So what is this technique? It is essentially um, a percutaneous inner body reconstruction using a roughly 10 millimeter cannula that you put into Kamen's triangle and you work through that cannula. Um, you do the inner body preparation mostly using the C-arm and so it's, not, it's uh, image guided. Uh, and then I use the endoscope to make sure that there's no neural elements within the surgical corridor and to check the end plate prep and confirm that uh, it's adequate. A lot of people don't use the endoscope, but you have to have another way to make sure that you've done a good end plate prep. Um, and because most of my cases require a cage that's going to be greater than 8 to 10 millimeters, it has to be expandable because it's going through a small opening um, where the exiting nerve root is a great risk for irritation. So this is another case where expandable technology is important. And then through separate perimeter incisions, I put in percutaneous pedicle screws. That's the surgery that I'm describing. And that surgery actually has been around. So if you ask, like, what's the literature support for all this? It turns out there's actually a fair amount dating back five to ten years. Um, not a lot, but enough that you get the idea it works in the right hands if you know what you're doing. So the question that I want to address is, if it works and it's reasonably cool and it seems easy, why such a poor adoption? And my guess is, is that, like most of the things related to MIS, it has to do with the learning curve. So what I want to present is my learning curve experience because I just started doing the surgery uh, about a year and some months ago. Um, so I have 17 cases where I have at least one year follow-up and I want to use those 17 cases to explain to you kind of what I found and hopefully make it so that uh, you don't have to climb the same learning curve and get a sense of why I'm excited about this technique. So if you just look at the preoperative ODI scores, visual analog scale scores for back, right leg, left leg, you can see that the results are successful. Everyone's going down. It's all statistically significant. The length of stay is about one day if you take all those 17. So two patients went home on the same day, 13 went home on post-op day one, and two patients that are like ER patients, you know, they're, they're going to stay two, three days no matter what you do to them. You can like do hangnail surgery and they'll stay two days. Uh, if they did it in the surgery center, they would have easily gone home on post-op day one, but uh, we have those two outliers. But this is one where you can easily do an ambulatory surgery center with a 23-hour stay on a regular and consistent basis. And check this out. If you take those 17 patients and you average their PGII score, which is a seven-point Likert scale starting from great to terrible, their PGII score is 1.35. Almost all of them are, are ones, several twos, and I think one three. There are no fours, fives, sixes, and sevens. So 
it's a wildly successful operation. But like every operation, there's all the drawbacks. So let me talk to you about that because that's probably the thing that really keeps people from adopting this wholeheartedly. The first is, even after all the endoscopic surgery, all the MI surgeries that I do, I still got five postoperative radiculopathies. They're all temporary. Uh, they were all better within six weeks. But in the interest of time, this is basically what I discovered. You don't want, do not want to start this uh, procedure in patients that have severe neuroforaminal stenosis. It seems like it would be a great idea because you're there anyway and you're going to ream out the neural foramen on your way in. But just that process in the setting of a really tight neural foramen where a nerve is already under a lot of compression or there's just not enough working room, they're more likely to get a uh, postoperative radiculopathy, especially at L5-S1, in part because of the angle and the coronal or the sagittal orientation of the uh, facet joints and probably because the L5 nerve root is just very sensitive. It's like a delicate Asian flower. So um, I would not try this at least for your first cases on those two types of patients. And then the other group uh, that I noticed is that a few patients already had a pre-existing deficit. So my guess is that if you already have a pre-existing deficit, that nerve is already vulnerable to injury. So if you start mucking around in there under a tight uh, space, you're more likely to get problems. So for now, I would avoid, avoid doing patients with those three characteristics. And I think that will greatly limit the amount of postoperative radiculopathy that you'll get. But, that would be the topic of a second discussion. What else did I learn? Well, I learned that the inner body reconstruction is very difficult because I try very hard to do a really good inner body uh, reconstruction and rely a lot on indirect decompression. So as I started doing this case, I noticed I'm getting a fair amount of subsidence too. So here are the 17 cases. I put the first three, the middle three, and the last three, just pre-op, post-op x-rays. And if you look carefully, it's hard to see you can see they're not the prettiest, sexiest x-rays I've ever had. In fact, they look pretty ugly and homely. Here's the second, like middle three. Now you're starting to see, well, it's a little bit better, especially case nine. And then here's the last group of three, 13, 14, and 15. And now you can start to see pretty good inner body reconstruction, uh, very little subsidence. Things are looking really good. So begs the question, how did I get there and how do you avoid making the same mistakes that I did and just jump to case number nine and start looking at some good cases. In 11 seconds, I'm going to try to tell you. <laughs> number one, you want to be McCoy in Star Trek. You want to be an interventional radiologist and you want to be looking at a perfect lateral x-ray as you're doing the discectomy so that you know you're directly in line with the end plate. And then I have two kind of uh, specialty instruments. This one is the spinning brush. It's on a, a driver and it spins in there. You have to be careful with it make sure your cannula doesn't back out or that it goes out the front. But it's a great way to basically do a rapid debulking and a lot of the anti cartilage comes off. And then I use this thing called the Batman. It's an expandable rotating shaver, but one side is blunt and the other side is sharp. It used to come as both sides sharp, but I didn't get enough tactile feedback and I'd often gouge. And by using really good lateral floral and this one-sided rotating shaver, those are the two things that I mainly rely on to do the majority of the end plate prep. And I'm really, really careful. So if you want to be really careful, you bring an endoscope in and you look down there and you make sure that you have a really good end plate prep all the way front and back. It's a very narrow, long end plate prep. And then finally, I take a trajectory where I can put in the longest cage possible because the cage is only eight millimeters wide. So I use routinely a 34. Sometimes I have to go down to a 30, depending on patient size. And by going at a very oblique angle, you can put a slightly longer cage in so you can see they tend to go line to line, and that entry point is 15 centimeters up from the midline, whereas most of my pedicle screws uh, go in at four centimeters off the midline. So it's multiple separate incisions. And then you've got to use an inner body, expandable inner body spacer if the space that you're going to end up with is smaller than the posterior annulotomy window or the cannula. And I call this the inner body erection. Just sit back and enjoy it because you can see it makes a huge difference. So here are my thoughts on this overall. Number one, it's a surgery that I really love. It's a surgery that my patients love, even though it's challenging. And it's probably the most promising technology that I have right now where I can reliably use this in the ambulatory surgery center setting, a freestanding one, where I can routinely be assured that they can go home in 23 hours. And it's a very fast and slick operation. I can do this surgery in less than two hours usually. But 
I hope you understand from this talk, a lot more work is needed to fine tune our access, our end plate prep. We need better expandable implants that are more lordotic, um, et cetera. So thank you. <laughs>